My name is Tim Upton and I'll be your host. First, I'll start by introducing our speaker, Beth Hurry. Then she'll give her presentation, which will be about 20 minutes, followed by a 10 minute question and answer session. If you do think of any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the chat box at any time. So now I'd like to introduce Beth Hurry. She is a senior principal engineer with over 30 years of experience providing engineering support and consulting services. Her expertise spans across the disciplines of process engineering and consulting, food safety, process safety, P and ID development, and piping layout and constructability. Beth is a graduate of the University of Dayton with a BS in chemical engineering and is a licensed professional engineer in multiple states. So with that, I will turn it over to Beth for today's presentation. Thank you, Tim, and thank you everybody for joining. Uh, so today we're gonna take a quick look and critical factors in bulk material handling. This is an extremely broad topic, but what I want you to come away from this webinar with is what questions you should be asking when you want to convey products and a sense that you don't want to forget some of the, what some people would say are lesser properties of bulk materials. So moving from that, we're gonna look at the agenda. We're gonna take a real quick look, walk through bulk material conveying types. There's 10 general ones. Because as we talk through the bulk material properties, we're gonna to touch on some of the conveyor considerations relative to them. Then we'll take a quick look at how does commingling and blended products work into a, bulk, a material conveying and how those properties should be considered. Layout and flow considerations, a little bit on cleaning and maintenance considerations, and then some relative cost considerations that you want to take a look at. So as I said, there's very broadly uh, 10 bulk material conveying types. One is a screw conveyor. They come in many shapes, sizes, angles, everything from feeders, such that we have pictured, to single conveyors and everything in between. The next would be a drag conveyor type. And those come from your standard rectangular ones that we see in a lot of grain industries, round bottoms, and some shaped conveyors that help with some clean out in more of our food-based products. The tubular conveyor is another useful one that's come onto the scene. Those can come in cable and chain versions. Uh, they allow uh, some more flexibility in vertical and horizontal movement because they're much tighter clearances and tend to be able to gently move some of our more friable materials. Pendulum conveyors are also good from that standpoint. Uh, big difference between a pendulum conveyor and say a normal bucket elevator is that the pendulums fill by when they are flat, they interlock. So they don't have that digging action. They also keep the material always in the vertical pendulum. So you can do some interesting configurations with them before discharging. Next is your belt conveyor. Those are good for long distance conveying. They can be open, they can be closed. A number of materials, as long as it will form a nice stable pile. The, some of the later developments here are a wrap-up belt conveyor, and that's where you feed product onto the belt. It wraps itself into something that looks a lot like pipe. That is then conveyed across longer distances. You unwrap it, dump it out, wrap it back up, and send it back. Can be used for bi-directional conveying. Uh, if you're going long distance with a product and then you want to bring a different product back, you can do that with that kind of technology. Then we have vibratory conveyors, uh, which come in both your normal vibratory, your linear motion, which moves material kind of in a um, kind of a pulsing manner. And then they do also, vibratory can go uphill uh, in a tower style. Seven is pneumatic. Basic three, there's some inner, there's some interchangeability, but you've got dilute phase, you've got dense phase, and then some semi-dense phases uh, in moving or a slug. Eight would be your bucket elevator, the workhorse of the ag industry. Uh, great for moving things top to bottom, not so great if you don't want to have things mixed together, if you've got a lot of ingredients. 
Gravity, we can't forget that is actually a valid way to transport things and takes out a lot of our uh, problems with mixing or clumping or bridging. Container systems would be the 10 one, and that's where you want to make a batch and then move that batch somewhere. And you've got lots of ingredients, lots of mixed ingredients can be useful with your container systems. So we'll move right into what kind of material properties affect conveying. The big four are density, size, flowability, and abrasiveness. Those you are the ones that you can't size a conveyor without knowing. So density comes in three flavors, bulk, condensed, and fluidized. Conveyors are volumetric devices. They move mass, but they do it by volumetrically conveying them. So you have to remember that as you look at your properties and the technologies. The bulk density is would take a one cubic foot box, fill it full of material, draw a level across the top of it. That's going to be your bulk density. Uh, if that can be changed, as in it condenses while you're transporting, or it's easily fluidizable, you need to take that into consideration because you may need to adjust the size of your equipment to take into that fluidized account. Then we have particle size. So some conveyors with very close clearances are good at, at transporting small, fine materials. Some of the ones with bigger clearances, not so much. So size can be very fine. It can be fine, which is less than an eighth of an inch. It can be granular, which is anything under a half an inch and mixtures thereof. Sometimes you can be in between the two. Lumpies greater than a half an inch. And then you have your irregular shapes, things that are stringy or fibrous. Uh, take, for instance, something like the gas coming out of the sugar industry uh, would be both stringy, fibrous, and irregular, very irregularly shaped. So then we get to flowability, and that has a very significant effect. Things can be water-like. If you have a water-like ingredient, it's not going to move very well in mechanical conveying. It's going to cascade. It's not going to form a good distinctive pile. It may go all over uh, the table when you dump it on it. A very free-flowing material is a little better than water-like, but that again is going to give you some problems if you're coming into a conveyor and it's very short to the discharge point of the conveyor. It may just flow right past your conveyor. And then, so if you were using it to try a meter, it wouldn't work very well because the material would just run past it. Free flowing, that will move nicely. Um, it forms a nice pile. It has a very low slide angle um, and therefore will move quite nicely through things, but can give you fits at getting to, to go uphill in a conveyor. Average flowing is kind of your average uh, sort of ingredient. Um, it flows nicely, has something, a slight angle, less than 60, uh, forms nice piles, has some nice cohesiveness between the particles, so the friction between the particles will help it move along well. So it's just a very nice ingredient to handle. Sluggish ingredients don't really want to move, they want to bridge. Um, Usually they're going to take some sort of activation to get them started if you started with them in a hopper or a bin. Um, and then we have cohesive materials. Those really don't want to move. Um, you're definitely going to have to have activation. You may have trouble getting them out of a conveyor once you get them into a conveyor. So those are the, the basic ones um, that flow. Now, from an abrasive standpoint, that's how heavy duty you need to make your equipment. Abrasiveness can go from mild to moderate to extreme. And extreme abrasive materials are gonna require specialized coatings or specialized selection of materials to reduce your wear and increase the time between when you have to change wear parts. So you have to be careful in an extreme one that over time, if you're not doing your preventative maintenance, or you're not watching your wear, all of a sudden your conveyor may not be moving the amount of material that you want it to move. And that could be because you wore enough of the paddles or the screw off that it no longer has the ability to transfer the ingredient at the rate you want. 
Now we can look at some of the other bulk material properties, and there are quite a few of them, and a lot of them are fairly critical. Hygroscopic is one of them. Hygroscopic are ingredients that want to suck up water. They want to turn to glass or they want to clump up because they're taking in that water. Uh, a lot of times those are going to need well sealed conveyors and may even require desiccated and sweep air to keep them dry enough. Uh, if you leave that kind of material in a conveyor, it's probably going to clog up something and it may even keep your conveyor from moving. It could solidify to that much of an extent. Good to look at your horizontal particle interactions. Will it drag other, part of, other particles of the same material along with it? If you're trying to use a mechanical conveyor, such as a, a drag conveyor, end mass or bulk. And end mass materials, absolutely, if you don't have that friction interaction between your particles, won't even move horizontally and the paddles will just move through the material as opposed to grabbing that bulk and pulling it along. Vertical particle interaction, that's important when you start wanting to go up an incline or a vertical with a mechanical conveyor. Um, if you don't have enough strength to hold that particle pile on your paddle or on your other piece on your uh, on the screw, then you're going to have material moving, coming backwards. Or if you have one of those water-like materials, it's all just going to stay at the bottom of your conveyor and never actually go up. So you want to make sure that if you want to go vertically, um, that you have the frictional interactions that you need to do that. Watch for things that interlock, mat or agglomerate as you're going along. That might not be a problem if you're trying to do that. It would be a problem if you don't want it to do that. Packing under pressure is another one of those things that you have to pay attention to if you put mechanical energy in and it wants to pack. You're going to have to make sure that you've included horsepower to take care of that and large enough discharges to be able to get it out if it did pack. Aerating becoming fluid. Uh, as we talked to that fluid density under bulk density, if movement in a mechanical conveyor is enough to fluidize it, you may need a bigger conveyor to make sure that you have enough volume as it fluidizes. Also, uh, from a pneumatic standpoint, you'll want to know if you have a settling velocity that's really low. And then you have to watch that velocity between those cartridges or bags to make sure that your material will actually fall out and discharge from that receiver. Again, very light fluffy things goes to the size. Also can be said with heavy materials. If you have very heavy materials, it may not take a large conveyor, but it may take quite a bit of horsepower. And if you're doing more than one, you'll want to make sure that you size the volume on the low density and the horsepower on the top density. Then we talk about for food grade materials that where we want to keep them food grade or if they're microbiologically active, want to make sure that you are using sealed equipment. You may not, in those cases, be able to use say a screw conveyor with a hanger bearing because you might have uh, the lubrication from that would not be acceptable. So you're going to want to keep out ledges. You're going to want to welds that are smooth. You may even need to polish it. And then you'll have to come up with your cleaning frequency that will remove any residual uh, that matches your amount of commingling that you can allow. Builds up or hardens touched on that a little bit. Does it tend to stick to the walls? Are you going to have to do something to have a release, some smoother surface than say steel or stainless? Does it become plastic or soft? It goes the other way. Can it break apart because the mechanical energy softened it up? Friable, brittle, or breakable. Do I want my kibble to go in one end and come out the other end looking exactly like it did? Or can I take some breakability through the process? Anytime you don't want to break things up, you want to have slow and plenty of room. Very slow movement is helpful and not a lot of particle interaction where they can bang together and break apart. For instance, in a, like say you were going to bake with sugar and you were going to transfer it a long distance, you would not want to use a pneumatic configuration that had a lot, tons of velocity and break it up 
because you want that crystal structure in the baking. However, if I was going to melt it, as long as I didn't create enough fines to change the transport properties, it doesn't matter if it breaks up a little bit. And then keep an eye on corrosivity. Make sure you've picked the right material of construction. Are there oils that also will affect gaskets and other materials of construction? Elevated temperatures. Do I have something that's super hot? If I do, you better watch the alloy. And then you're also going to have to contend with thermal expansion. That conveyor is going to want to grow, and you're going to have to be able to contend with that in the layout. Then the last two go to combustible dust and handling those. Um, does your ingredient generate static during particle interaction? If it does, you'll have to be careful how those are bonded and grounded and that we are taking steps to dissipate it. You might have to have non-combustible or spark um, free construction. Some of the things that you need to make sure of with a combustible dust, because that's going to come up, is you're going to want to know your MIE, which is your minimum ignition energy. You're going to want to know your KST, which is a measure of how easy it is to ignite a cloud in the basic form. There's more details to that. Uh, the PBAX, how strong that explosion is going to be after you ignite it. And then your layer temperatures. So at what point will I um, ignite a layer that might have escaped my equipment? Or if I have a bearing or something internal and it gets hot, at what level do I need to be watching for that? Is that a concern? Um, our friends at Imperial Sugar will tell you that's a big concern. Then um, humans are wonderful at generating sparks. We can generate them in the 10 to 22.5 millijoules, which doesn't seem like a lot, but some of the vitamins, and there are some other ingredients out there that have MIEs that are three millijoules. So at that point, it's very critical to understand that and know and plan for what you're going to do to mitigate any kind of sparks, even from a person. Next, we look at, okay, what if I have one component or I've got a lot of components? If I've got one or two things I want to move from point A to point B, that's going to simplify my choices. I'm going to understand those ingredients and it won't be near as much work. But if I've got a lot of ingredients, it becomes very complicated very quick because you need to understand the properties of all of them so that you can tell if there's one that's going to cause you a problem because you may not be able to convey all of your ingredients with the same type of conveying. You may have to split that up based on the properties and also which ones can have commingling between them. Uh, so it's good to inventory all the ingredients. And then if you can, test on your design or conveying method. Because a lot of the bulk conveyors are still on the well, we've been doing this for 30 years and this is how we do, but we've now put a whole lot more uh, ingredients into the mix for our processes. Commingling and blending, understand the level of commingling and blending that's allowed. Um, that will guide you into different choices for your conveying. If you're gonna minimize commingling, minimize, uh, you want to, uh, horizontal is good, that tends to minimize commingling, and then gravity verticals do. Anytime you have other mechanical means, those will start to elevate that. Understand if your blend is stable or prone to segregation. Picture I have here, mixed looks great. Even just coming out of the hourglass, you can see you've not mixed anymore. So take that into account if you're starting to use blends. For a vertical movement, this is from one to nine of our um, ways to move from least commingling to most. If you put ingredients in an elevated hopper and dose it directly down, you're going to have your least commingling. If you have pneumatic, as long as you have good release, you'll have the next level. Closed tube conveyors, if size and material are appropriate, can be good. Then your pendulum conveyors, if it's not too fluffy or fluidizable, you have a little bit coming off the end, but are off the sides, so they are not without having some residual. 
but they're far better than say a bucket elevator. Inclined conveyors up to about 60 or round bottoms to 45 if your material can move like that. Go much above that, then you start pulling off the bottom and can give you places in that are not going to catch and transport. Bucket elevators are next. Inclined screws after that. Vertical drags. We just talked about having the problem that they pull off the bottom. So there's always that little spot in that end curve that you're not going to get some of your material. And you have to know whether that's okay for your process. And then vertical screw conveyors and helical inclines like the flexicons and some of the others, those don't empty all the way. So if you really cannot have um, commingling in between the products, you're going to have to pull that end plate and remove the uh, material out of the bottom of those types of conveyors. Remember that inclines will reduce your capacity and increase your horsepower. Um, from a layout and flow consideration, obviously minimize vertical elevation changes between unit operations will minimize your chance for commingling. Uh, for conveyors um, that are part of batch operations, you need to watch the three components. Baseline bulk rate, increase that for travel time, and increase for cleanout. You have to look at all three to make sure your conveyor is big enough to meet your batch requirements. And then make sure you specify how a conveyor will be fed, because if it's metered or flood, is different in how the conveyors are designed. Uh, cleaning and maintenance. Mechanical conveyors will have residual. You just have to decide how much is acceptable to you as you pick how you want to convey. Um, if you can convey it by hand, if it's truly critical, you might want to put it directly into where you want it to go. Uh, if they're going to add um, Ingredients separately into a mechanical. Make sure your smaller amounts are bracketed by larger amounts of material that want and are easily conveyed and try and clean the walls and floor. Do your predictive and preventive maintenance checks to make sure you stay up with your capabilities. And then if you go to change a product or an incline of an existing conveyor, that could render it ineffective. So make sure you go through this process of making sure you understand the ingredient that you're going to change to. Cost-wise, product um, that's being moved may dictate the technology or you may have some choices to be able to decide between which one you like best. Mechanical conveyors are available over large ranges of prices. The more clean design, typically the higher initial cost. Uh, mechanical horsepower will pretty much always be less than the pneumatic horsepower required for the same rate. Mechanicals have higher cleaning costs, especially if you're minimizing commingling. You may have to take those apart and clean them, and that needs to be um, accounted for in your process flow. So as a bonus, we have a property tabulation sheet that if you email me, I will be happy to send you. It lets you list the ingredients, and then all of those factors that we talked about, it lets you say um, input what those values are and whether something is corrosive or is not. And then that can be used to evaluate the kind of conveying that you want to use based on the properties of your ingredients. At this point, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Beth. That was an excellent information packed presentation. So now we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. I know Beth covered a lot today, so I'm sure that you have questions on how some of this might apply to your own facility. Uh, we'll give it about 30 seconds to a minute to let the initial questions come in, and then Beth will answer them for you. So again, just go ahead and enter those into the chat at this time. All right, Beth, so our first question is, are there any resources for test <clears throat> for testing these properties? Yeah, so there's a number of them. Um, 
especially for if you're testing combustibility, there's three or four. You can go through FAUS, BSMB, FIKE. Some of those all have labs that you can use. If you're designing a bin or you really need to understand some properties, com companies such as Jenicky and Johansson are a good resource to be able to help you uh, understand your material properties there. Okay, perfect. And then our next question is, when would it be a good, um, when would it be good to consider containerization? So we had that as one of our uh, bulk moving options to be able to containerize a system. If you have a um, lot of ingredients that are going to specific things and your rates aren't um, super high, then I would consider containerizing them before they're mixed. Because once you put it in all the ingredients in a container, maybe down low, and you're only going up one single level to be allow your containers, which also could even be in the basement, uh, that will allow you to move things and not worry about them being uh, any commingling. So whatever you put in the batch is going to get to your batch where you're gonna mix it. Okay. Uh, so our next one is, do you have a recommendation for conveying reject materials such as from a grain scalper machine? So it depends on which reject you're talking about. Um, from, say, a grain scalper, uh, the overs rejects you probably don't really want because typically in that I've seen those being even critters. Um, the unders from that, if it's good, um, you can take that back and say grind it. If it, let's just take corn for instance, um, the cracked corn that comes off of the bottom of that um, is nothing wrong with it. Uh, so that can be put back in, but you have to look at where you might wanna put that back in the system. Because for instance, in corn, um, you're gonna have more uh, starch say in a corn mill you, that you would not have review, removed. And you're gonna have to want to look at that relative to your, where you wanna put that, where that ingredient will fit. Uh, did that answer your question? I believe so. Uh, if not, can you please uh, post your follow-up in the chat? Yes, that did. So thank you, Beth. All right, our next one is, do I really need to look at all of my ingredients? Yes, because some can, if you've got a whole lot of them, it's those sneaky ones that can come back and get you. So you at least have to take a, an inventory look at all of them. Okay. And then <clears throat> the next one is, do you have a recommendation for the best conveyors for very hydroscopic materials? Can hydroscopic materials be successfully stored and discharged from vertical storage silos? So that one's tricky. Um, possibly not large ones. That's one of those where you'd want to make sure you really understand how hygroscopic that is. And I would suggest doing some testing on that. Closed ones, you might be able to get away with something along the lines of a well-sealed tube conveyor, as long as the air that's sweeping it is um, dry and you've desiccated the air that might be coming into it. You can pneumatically convey them as long as you have very dry air going into your system. Um, not totally a simple answer. You need to look at the material and then how much you want to store to go through and answer that question. Okay, perfect. Did that answer your question, Elizabeth? <laughs> we have any other questions? So we are right up on time. Um, Elizabeth said, sort of, I uh, understand, depends on the material. Correct. So, so there's varying levels of hygroscopic. So you've got some that if I put it on the table, it's unusable in five minutes. And some hygroscopic materials, I put it on a 70, uh, just a normal table, and it's, I can use it for a day or half a day before it starts to clump up. So you have to look 
it really is material dependent. So as a follow up to that, um, so we should <laughs> evaluate each component in the mixture. And is that what you mean by evaluating? Yeah, so if you have a mixture of 10 different ingredients, um, after you've mixed it, it's going to have one set of properties, but you should at least do that cursory inventory at each of the 10 ingredients to make sure you know if any of them are potentially going to shift the mix to where it may not be handleable in, say, a mechanical conveying. So that's why it's important to understand all of them. And then once you've mixed it, then you can take a look at that, which would be like your final batch, uh, to see if you've evened out the properties enough. If it's a batch that when you mix it is stable, you may have evened out some of those properties of, say, a hygroscopic material. If it's included at a very small rate, you may have evened that out and now you can handle the mix in a more traditional manner. Perfect. So we do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, we're right at 12.31, so this will be a real quick last call for anything else while we have Beth. It looks like that's all the questions. Um, but before I conclude today's webinar, um, if you'd like to email Beth, she will send you a um, <clears throat> she'll send you her property tabulation sheet as a thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, her email address is up on the screen, but it is b h e r y at adfengineering.com. So on behalf of ADF Engineering, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. We appreciate you spending time with us. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Uh, if you do have additional questions for Beth, please, <clears throat> please feel free to reach out and email her. I hope everyone has a great rest of the day and thank you again. Thank you, everyone.